friends at Genentech want to spread awareness about the condition. So here to tell us what we need to know is board certified. I have MS. <coughs> Had been, I don't know how long. I was diagnosed in 2013, but have been sick and having issues. Probably a good 10 years, I think. Noticing it somewhere around 2005, 2007, I noticed I was having issues. Went totally, you know, nonstop vertical since 2009. Couldn't really see vision crazy since 2009, and they were thinking I'm crazy, thinking I'm just want to be an eye doctor, thinking I want to be in the um in the eye doctor office just to be whining and complaining. I really couldn't see. But now, what? But anyway. So right now, vision, 10 years later, totally blind, right eye, glaucoma, cataract, left eye, cataract, cloudy vision, can barely recognize faces, and can't see, can't read words past after 10 minutes of reading, <laughs> all the words just fade into all white. And I can't read the words. So let's see what this lady has to say. When she mentioned I, I said, I? Okay, it's not a fun to find out. I didn't realize my eyes had anything to do with multiple sclerosis. I know the vertical did, but I didn't realize that not being able to see. I knew it, but I uh, didn't know it to a certain extent. Neurologist and MS specialist at the Joy Life Wellness Clinic, Dr. Mitzi Joy Williams, and the founder of the advocacy group, We Are Ill, Victoria Reese. Hello, Dr. Williams. Hello, welcome, Victoria. So I know a lot of us have heard of MS, but I don't know if everybody knows exactly what MS is. Dr. Williams, can you explain that? Absolutely. So MS is an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the central nervous system, and that includes the brain, the spinal cord, and the nerve to the eye. It's a Right now, I had to get, because my doctors didn't know anything, I had to go online and contact <coughs> a male clinic, and they asked me the information that the doctor told me. I told the doctor and all of that my doctor, and then they diagnosed my specific, there's four types, my specific type of MS. And I had to end up with the worst kind. <coughs> but yes. From what I understand, mine is my spine, because I had scoliosis. I noticed at age 12. <coughs> my mom didn't notice I was 18. Too late. Disease of young people, people are diagnosed between the ages of 20 and 40, hmm. and sometimes the symptoms can be confused with other things, so people may... So I was diagnosed in 2013, so I was 53, so I was past 50 have a delayed diagnosis, numbness and tingling, weakness, visual changes, and we want people to be evaluated early because early diagnosis and starting treatment with high... Visual changes started at 40, and the doctor said, oh, um, how you say that thing, your eyes are... That's what happens when you get older, your eyes go back. So that's the first time I noticed the eye changes was that. Um, third, which I had, um, if I go back and remember, I had, um, eye strain in my 20s, so it would be hard to see, my eyes are hurt, and the doctor said, he said, I could see good, okay, just that it was eye strain, so I did have the eye strain in my 20s, where I would have to, I, I would, I, sight would just go, and everything would just be, fade away. So yeah, I wouldn't. So yeah, I did have that, but I didn't. I didn't realize that it was a part of the MS. 
that um, hit me later in my mid 40s. Efficacy therapy could potentially delay long term disability. Okay, I didn't know that between 20 and. And yes, I am on long term permanent disability because of it. I went to college and everything, went back to college 18 years later when I was in my 40s and the kids were teenagers. Did very well. Just um, graduated in 2013. So when I was very sick then, so I couldn't get, I couldn't get all the classes that I want. So I ended up getting what I could physically get before I pass out and die. <laughs> Trying to walk down the aisle, but I did something. So it helped me today with the information that I did learn. It's, a, it's able to me to know how to do some things on, on here because I understand the technology, technical part of it, even though that you, the, the front end of the eye. I have issues seeing it, so it's a bit much, but I do what I can. 40. Wow. Okay, so Dr. Williams, are there certain groups? things so people may have a delayed diagnosis numbness and tingling weakness visual changes and we want people to be evaluated early because early diagnosis and starting treatment with high efficacy therapy could potentially delay long-term disability okay i didn't know that between 20 and 40. wow okay so dr williams are there oh, okay. certain groups who are more i stopped because i heard her say 40 i needed to know um the connection with the 40 so between 20 and 40. i was past 40. And, um, because the other doctor had, to, I ended up leaving another doctor because he been running all these tests two and three times and driving the insurance company crazy because he just milking the insurance company not doing, saying he don't know what's wrong. But it was a, um, a lady doctor in there that, that tell me, called me in her office. She said, he's not going to tell you. She said, but I'm going to tell you what you, I'm going to tell you you have MS. And she gave me a pamphlet and told me so I could read about it. And I read about it, and I went online. I became a part of the um, um, Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, getting new little stuff so I fully understand um, what my situation was. But that doctor never told me. But when she told me, she went back and get him to, um, what do you call it, for lack of a better word, second it. And he did. And then... I got tired of that doctor because he tried to give me a um, service cancer, which I didn't have. Because I, I, I knew what the lady saw, but that wasn't it. And I wasn't going to no doctor who trying to give me stuff I don't innately sense that I have. But I innately understood when she mentioned that because it resonated with all these issues that I had. So my third doctor, very good doctor, he couldn't have found out. He was an internal doctor. I couldn't find out. He had a lot of, the majority of his patients are multiple sclerosis patients. But some of the state of South Carolina, <laughs> I don't know what's going on, but he stopped dealing and doing the muscle sclerosis thing, and then he had a, um, what you call, adult, what you call, um, adult care, um, family practice. Um, he's really good at what he does. So, so he, the one that made sure I got my disability, put that paperwork in, faxed it to them. That they, they didn't get it, which is what they most to do. He come back, went to where you need. They needed a number instead of what the diagnosis was. So he went thing find what the little code number was, put it in there, faxed it again, gave me a couple of, bam, boom. They got my um. Got my disability, um, which I already had, but it was going through the stages of um, going through the stages of every year they do a review or something, and then after all of that, well, yeah, that basically got my student loans. Um, yeah, he doing that with the disability company got my student loans. Um, um, what's the word? Got them, um, lack of a better word, counts. I don't have to pay them no more. So I had like $12,000 in student loan because I only went part-time. 
so he got my student loans um, discharged. Got the student loans discharged, and he gave me all of the equipment that I need to be able to walk. I need a rollator because upper upper chest issues. I couldn't literally walk. You know how these um these um stainless steel walkers that these um old elderly have. I couldn't walk with that, and they tried to teach me how to walk with it. All I do is fall over because it got something to do with my upper chest. I'm just not able to do anything upper. But, um, waist down. Boy, kick it across the room. Even though the legs are weak. It's a weirdness to that. But anyway. But anyway, um, that's how that ended up with, um, me. And, and... The symptoms has gotten better, but still, it's always there. Because she may name the type that I have, which I know the type that I have, but it's four types. Or at risk for developing MS? Absolutely. So traditionally, MS has been thought of as a young white woman's disease. Mm. Um, we know that women are much more affected, but they're... And that's what I was told when, it, when I didn't know what was wrong. And they hadn't died, no shit. And I went to a seminar where you had about two or 3,000 people. And I was sitting in there with my rollator, sitting in a chair, you know, all my little bags and stuff. And this particular lady asked me, is, um, because nobody on the study, but I was just faking nothing wrong with you, just, I keep thinking nothing more terrible than you so sick. And everybody treats you like ish. Because they say you faking, you just want sympathy, you always complaining, you this, you that, nothing wrong with you, you just, ugh. But anyway, this lady looked at me, she said, is there someone in your family that was sick and nobody understood her? I said, yeah, I have an aunt, which is my um, daddy's aunt, my grandmother's sister. And she had long, silky, black, um, Puerto Rican type slick hair. And, she, and her skin was, she was um, really, really fair skin. So, and my grandmother was dark like me. And she had the hair like me, but she was just and so. She was sick, and everybody was, um, nobody understood her. They thought she was putting on. They said she just didn't want to work. And we, we were little kids. We used to go see her. And she would always be sitting in her bed waiting for somebody to take care of her. She could. They would bring everything to her because she could basically wash herself, feed herself, get us a dress, all of that. But she couldn't go past the bed. And they wanted, I, I knew she was sick. I knew something was wrong with her. There was nothing wrong with her. She just, just so they, they just, just let her whine all the time. They didn't have no sympathy for the woman. But some things that they say the kind of person she used to be um, when she had a good health, um, so you got, um, got something to do with that. But they just thought the woman was lazy. And then she said, and she asked me what she, um, like, said, you can look at her and tell she was um, biracial. There, there, there was just no um, getting past that. As far as looking at her, even in even in her, I don't know how old she was when she died. But I was a little child, so I think like old people back then. But she could have very well been in her forties or fifties. I don't know. But anyway, and she said, and and she the one that mentioned that if she was mixed. And she, and she mentioned that it being a white people's disease. So that's the first time I heard it. So apparently whatever's wrong with her, it went from, because she is my daddy's aunt. So that will make her my, that will make her my grand aunt. And I guess whatever her issue was just came straight through to me. And I guess I'm supposed to figure out how to not end up like her. They keep you moving anyway, even if people shoot you down, telling you lazy, you just don't want to do nothing. It's horrible. But anyway, 
her name was at Joseph. I said, yeah, Joseph, I'm up. I'm mostly in my bed and room, but I can get around and do whatever I want to do because I put the effort to do what I want to do. And the one thing that I do to make sure that I can move around, even though my torso area, like I'm kind of weak in that area and the legs go to buckle in the week, I lean my bed, I do my leg exercise, arm exercises. I do the legs, I wear the, wear the moves, the joints, keep the joints limber. I do my yoga, and I'm doing yoga since my, um, since I'm a teenager. I mean, I saw the little lady on the TV, and then it, tra- and then it went to her mama. Then I saw her on TV, and I would do it with her. And so I do old yoga now, but I basically just make up my own, because I've been doing it so long. And my body, I can do a split at age 62. So my body is basically limber. I can do things uh, a lot of my children can't do. Like fold my legs, split, do all kinds of, put my arm, do all kinds of this weird little thing. And that's because even though I'm confined, I was confined to my bed, I would do my yoga leg exercise. And I would hold on to things so my body would stay loose and not stiff, even though from the... um. Even though, but there re- even though from the waist up to the um, chest, I have a lot of issue with that. But anyway, let's finish it up. Study suggesting that actually it's occurring a lot more commonly in Black and Hispanic Latinx communities. Okay. This is the truck that helps keep families safe, and the truck that helps you get fun communities mm. than we previously thought and they're also stuck and that's true i don't know about hispanic and i heard um i don't know about the black community yeah but i'm finding out other people that have it because i know a lady she ran to the residential home my sister was in and her i don't know if it's her do- i don't think it's her daughter her niece her niece has ms and this girl's like in her 20s and she was bedridden, and she when she when she asked me how I managed to get around. It's the uh, it's not something that you can tell somebody to do when you're dealing with it yourself and you're mentally figuring out how to function because you're a mother or wife, four kids, and they don't want to hear you sick. They don't want to hear. It. They think you're just putting on. You're fake. You're lazy. You're just lazy. That's what I've been hearing from everybody. But after she didn't ask me a few times, I just tell her. I said, it's up to her. I said, I, said, I, was, I, was, I was in a wheelchair. I had a walker. Then I went to a cane. Mentally, you have to be strong. And that's what I did. I can't do a lot of things, but I can do many things. I can't do certain things, but I can do other things. And sometimes they get me judged. Oh, how you can do this and you can't do that? Oh, this person can do this and you can't do that. But she's in her bed completely, can't do anything. And I, I got to tell him, after... I just can't tell her what to tell this girl because it's based on the individual person. And it's something that you yourself have to go deep inside of yourself and decide that you're not going to be laid in your bed. Like, she laying in her bed, can't do anything. But Maya Joseph, like I'm sitting on the side of my bed right now, she's just sitting on the side of her bed. She can and she'll go. She can go to certain areas in the room in front of me. That's about it. But anyway, but he's suggesting that the incidence may be highest in Black women, and this is really important because there's more disability that could occur. Um, there also is more, um, you know, f- uh, physical changes over time, and we don't have enough research with these populations to understand why we're seeing those trends. Wow. You know, Victoria, as a black woman, and Dr. Williams is talking about our group, can you tell us what your experience is with MS? Sure. So I was diagnosed in 2012 at the age of 25. Um, I just started to pursue my career as a talent agent. Age 25, she got um, diagnosed early. I got diagnosed 
um, a real, a literal diagnosis, because neither one, because even the second dog that went through, he wasn't diagnosed because of some reason, some South Carolina got something with people, and he kind of tell me, but he didn't really tell me, so I really don't understand what South Carolina issues is with MS people, whereas people stop having the help there for MS people. Couldn't think about it. I know another girl, she, my size, you know, my complexion, and she has MS. And then, yeah, it's quite a few black people in MS. Because that's the, thinking about it, two off the top, two, three, four, two, three. Get off the top of my head. And I'm pretty sure more will be popping up. But she got, I got, thinking, um, she, I think she diagnosed me in 2000, because already, 2008, 2009, I want to think it was today, 2009, and I went, I was just screwed up. I couldn't even stand up and walk, so it was horrible. It was miserable. Oof. In Los Angeles, and I started to notice I was having numbness and tingling in my legs. Mm. Um, it actually took me about, like... Yeah, she had numbness and tingles. I had total noodle weakness. Six months to actually see a doctor about it because I thought it would pass. Yeah. Um, but when I did go see my primary care physician, I was dismissed and I was told that it was just stress. Um, so I actually, my symptoms started to get worse. Yeah, I understand that dismiss because it, my dog didn't dismiss my fact that my body would just freeze up and I couldn't move and had to call an ambulance take me to the hospital. Because my body just froze up, I couldn't talk. All I could do was sit down on the table and look at everybody. I could hear everybody, but I couldn't talk. Took me to the hospital. Um, I was in there for a few days, and they sent me home with a wheelchair. And I mentally uh, exercised my legs, you know, doing the little leg exercises until I was able to get up out of bed. And when I got home, got in my wheelchair. Nobody wanted to push my wheelchair because they thought I was sick, and I'm going to be at the house, sitting at the house in the wheelchair. I said, Dag, if that happened. I got out and pushed myself around in that wheelchair in this house and exercised and got myself out of that chair. Called my son. I said, now, pick this wheelchair in the car and take it back to the place you get it from because I am not keeping this chair. And I got the doctor. I said, I asked him about a rollator. He said, oh, that's all you need. Bam, boom, signing up. I say I had trouble walking because I literally fell at the Walmart and the woman had asked her husband to help me because of my ability to walk was so bad. And he said, oh, oh a handicapped T.K., oh, that was neat. Bam, boom, sign it up. My other doctor wouldn't do none of that. And the ladies at the front desk just make it worse. Y you having such a hard time, but these people don't want to give you what you need because of whatever. But this doctor, he gave me what I needed, and I was able to continue functioning and getting myself the way I need to be. Worse. And one day I woke up with an excruciating migraine, and I had numbness in my face. So they sent me to get... Now, I ain't nobody numbness in the face, but the excruciating migraine, oh, my God. Teeth go... Um, the little bone on it. What that little bone back there by your ear? All the way up behind your eyes and your head and it's like a hammer, sledgehammer crushing my brain. I don't know how in the world... I handled that pain when I went to my doctor. They had me on some pain medicine, cause no, no medicine. I didn't know what it was. All I know is I had a horrible headache. Even though my vitals were no one to say I had such horrible migraine, didn't know it was migraine, cause it was never diagnosed as migraine. I just know I had horrible headaches. I think I done had a couple of strokes and every kind of thing. Cause my be twisting, having slurred speech, and everybody thinking I'm just. Oh, she look at her falling asleep in church. Yeah, look at her, she just falling asleep. She just said, oh, my God. People are cruel when you have a mess. I wouldn't wish that on nobody. More MRIs, and that MRI came back showing nine lesions on my brain. So nine lesions on your brain? Nine lesions on her brain. So hers was her brain. I had two MRIs, didn't find anything, and the last one the doctor took. I always thought when they put that stuff in there, because, like I said, I'm one, I'm one out of the 25 that get throws up when the stuff in there to put you in that um, machine. Things so loud and crazy. He said, my brain was perfect. There were no lesions, gray spots, or nothing on it. All of my, so that when I, that when I, 
I, I heard, like, listening to interviews like this and realized mine was my spine. And they said, I had scoliosis forever. So I said, okay. So it was confirmed that I had MS. And I was really shocked because I thought it was a white woman's disease as well. And I was terrified because I knew that that was the first day of my new normal. Well, you know, it, well, Dr. Williams, if, if you know that there's no cure for MS, then what is the research that's being done to help patients? Yeah, so there's a lot of research that's being done. It's a really exciting time in the field of MS. And we manage MS like we manage other chronic conditions. Um, one of the things that I'm really excited about is the focus on diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. Mm -hmm. And we're actually partnering with Genentech, and I lead um, the CHIMES trial, which is the first ever clinical trial focused on Black and Hispanic Latinx people. People living with their so. Oh, so there. I get the um newsletters, so I heard when this stuff comes out about these new updates and stuff they have for MS patients. But I didn't realize it was so prevalent in Black Hispanic, I mean, which and I, I I'm most seeing that it's a whole lot of um Black women, I, but I also know a Black man that has it. But um, and, and and his wife spoke to me about his, and me and him basically have the same symptoms, whereas the other two symptoms are different from mine. But he's the only one who has the same symptoms that I have. But each MS patient has different, um, that their symptoms are different for each person. We're really excited about it, um, and in a group where people often say, oh, pe these people don't want to participate in trials, we actually enrolled ahead of time, and we over-enrolled. We have more people than we anticipated, so really exciting, but we certainly need more research, and we want people to get involved and talk to their health care providers about how they can get involved in research and in what ways. I'm so glad to hear that. If that you're paying attention to us. But it, what, is there any advice that you would give to somebody who was recently, who has been recently diagnosed with MS? Yeah, so my advice would be to get involved in the MS community, find your community, and to utilize the resources that are available, because there are resources available. Um, I see, in my town, I don't, because I'm just all by myself with no support from nobody for my illness. I didn't have the knowledge to find MS people, even though I have that knowledge now. But I'm not to a place where I don't see well, so driving is out of the question, so I have to be driven everywhere. And I can go in the stores, but I need to have somebody with me so they can help me see and uh, help me see what I want. But it's to that point. But I need to... I need to get in, but I do need to do that. But I have been thinking about it, but it's kind of hard to get into stuff when you don't, when you're not connected like that. After I was diagnosed, I noticed there was a lack of representation of black women in the MS space. I didn't see myself. So I was inspired to start my own advocacy. I don't know, that could be the reason why South Carolina don't stop all the Literally took all the took all the doctors went over you. I had to go from. I know my friend. She went to a whole another town, and that was she was going. Then he left, and she had to go to Columbia. And I found out he left. So there are no doctors. Literal, these doctors are MS doctors here, but they, for some unknown reason, had to get out of doing. The, I don't know if it got something to be funding or what. But I know something is behind it. Maybe because it's big, like she's saying, there's a lot of, especially black people or black women. I'm not saying it's a racist thing, but I'm just saying that might be it. I don't know. But I do know there's an issue with getting um, funding and help and care, even finding a doctor. So I don't know how my friend doing with her not being there with her second doctor. She had a <laughs> third doctor done left and she has no doctor so you gotta figure it out yourself but me and her pretty much figured out I'm not, I, I've never been on any medication but she's on medication everybody else I know is on medication but there's no cure but I got the kind that there's no medication for it at all so I got the worst kind <laughs> Other people can take medication, but I think they're saying they was coming up with a medication for, for the type that I have. 
But if I got to be shot up with a needle like insulin, not happening. Not happening because I am not doing it. I will, I'll say, I will stop eating, eat, exercise, and I'm going to be vegan for that purpose to make sure that I do whatever naturally to manage my illness and be as functional as I can. Because the organization, we are ill. We are ill. Yes, and we are redefining what sick looks like and ultimately helping black women have better health outcomes. And I think educating yourself is also important. We recently sat down and had a conversation as part of the MS Visibility Project, um, and there were black women from all different connections to MS, care partners, people living with MS, and myself as a physician. And we talked about things like how to advocate for yourself. What's unique to our experience? What does it mean to be vulnerable? Um, and I think that we have to have these conversations and that turn into a video series that people can view. So we want them to join the conversation. Yeah, and that would have been that... Um Knowing how to advocate for yourself might have saved you a lot, you know, you might have found out earlier yeah. about MS. And yeah. that's such a big deal. We go to the doctor and they don't, they dismiss us. Yeah. So I love that. And that's a set of videos that, that we can see. Yeah. Ladies, thank you so much. So that's it for this video. And I saw this. I had to come on and listen to this and see. I didn't, I didn't learn anything new. So this stuff I known for a while but I was looking to see if they were named the four types it's been a while probably a good 10 years since I learned what the type was but anyway um this is my story my um MS journey and if you like um um this video from a different perspective. Don't up the video. Subscribe to the channel if you want to uh, more from a different perspective. And I will see you next time. Bye.